Yeah. All right. So we're going live, people. We're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the seventh in our monthly series of virtual astronomy outreach events brought to you in collaboration between the Riverside Astronomical Society and the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of California at Riverside. Uh, my name is John Leader Bach Vega. I will be one of your co-hosts tonight. And I am the director of the outreach program at the Riverside Astronomical Society. But I am not by any means a formally trained astronomer, but I had loved astronomy ever since Neil Armstrong got out and ran around on the moon when I was just a boy. Um, my other co our, your other co-host is. Oh, uh, oh, you're calling me. <laughs> That's <Hi>. you. <laughs> Hello everyone, and my name is Sinan Du, and um, I am the outreach lead on the UCR side um, on behalf of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, my professional background is in astronomy, and specifically I study galaxies that are really, really far away from the Milky Way. Uh, we're very excited to continue our collaboration with the Riverside Astronomical Society and very happy to see that our monthly stargazing event is coming into 2021. So today we will uh, together have a very deep exploration of Orion. So why are we gonna be talking about Orion? It's big, it's beautiful, it's got amazing stars and nebulas. It's probably, if you only know one constellation, you probably, Orion is probably the one you know. Um, it's famous for some good reasons. And uh, it is my favorite constellation. And I think most of the people who have any kind of stargazing experience, it might be their favorite too. So we're gonna be checking out five different areas, either right in Orion or kind of right next door to Orion. Uh, Cause there's some pretty amazing stuff up in that part of the sky. Um, and again, if you can, don't just watch us tonight on your phone, you know, get a biggest, the biggest screen you can, tablet, even better would be your desktop computer. Even better would be the TV hanging on your wall. So go as big as you can, you won't be sorry. And if you want a preview of all the telescope targets or simply just the agenda of the event, you can simply just check out the description of the event, which is right under the live stream video that you're seeing. Um, we will also be having a live chat to take your questions. And next, I would love to introduce our vo lovely volunteers uh, that are here tonight with us, who will be moderating the live chat, um, which you can see on the right-hand side of the YouTube video. Um, so they are Jessica Doppel. Hi, I'm Jess Doppel. I'm a fourth year grad student at uh, UCR and I study uh, galaxy clusters and globular clusters. And I look forward to answering all your questions. Thanks, Jess. Uh, next, we have Franco. Hi there, my name is Franco Iglesias. I'm a CSULA graduate student studying physics for my master's degree. Cool, thank you. Uh, next we have Garrett. Hello everyone, my name is Garrett Lopez. I'm a second year graduate student at the University of California, Riverside. Um, my specialty is dark matter cosmology. Um, hope you enjoy the show tonight. Cool, thanks Garrett. Next we have Yungda. Hello everyone, my name is Yungda Zhu. I'm a third year PhD student in astronomy, also at UC Riverside. And my research topic is about early universe. Awesome. And finally, uh, last but not least, we have Cheryl. Hey everybody, I am a middle school science teacher by day and I am a long-term member of the Riverside Astronomical Society, part of their outreach team. So looking forward to a great night, enjoy. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we welcome all kinds of questions and also encourage discussions in the live chat. But as you can see, since we are a really large group, uh, we kindly ask you to respect others in the chat. So do not try not to spam or put uh, in a proper comment there. So most of the questions will be answered by our chat moderators and the remaining will be answered by the panel. So uh, this is our seventh stargazing event, as John mentioned earlier, and we're really excited to see some of the newcomers as well as the returning participants. Um, so we would certainly love to collect your feedback after this event on how we did tonight and uh, how we could potentially improve. 
And finally, as a new format that we just launched for 2021, you have a chance to enter a raffle at the end of the event. Our prize is a beautiful <laughs> NASA calendar, which will be shown by Jose. Um, so Jose, do you wanna, um, you know, try to also introduce this calendar a little bit? Uh, yes, um, I sure do. Um, so everybody here is a night, uh, 2021, really nice calendar by NASA that it contains a lot of information, a lot of information and beautiful pictures of different objects in the sky that we can all appreciate and enjoy. So I wish you luck to everybody uh, that will win one tonight, okay? Thank you, Jose. Yeah, so that's uh, our rifle prize today. Um, and we will share a Google uh, form link uh, for the raffle um, at the very end of this event. Uh, and we'll contact you if you win. All right, so without further ado, uh, should we start with our story, John? Oh yes, it's definitely story time. <laughs> Thousands of years ago in a land that we now know as Greece, three gods, Zeus, Hermes, and Poseidon, were wandering the surface of the earth and grew hungry. They stopped to visit a king who slaughtered an entire bull for the gods to feast upon. In gratitude for such a generous meal, the gods offered to grant the king one wish, and the king wished for a son. So the gods took the hide of the bull that they had just eaten, urinated on it, and told the king to bury it in the ground. They instructed the king to leave the furry coat in the ground for 10 months. When the time came, the king dug up the hide, and there in its place was a boy. And that was how the great Orion was born. Orion grew to be incredibly tall, strong, and handsome. He grew, he grew fond of the Pleiades, a group of seven sisters. He grew especially fond of their mother and gave chase to them all for seven years. Until Zeus intervened and gathered up the seven sisters and placed them among the stars, where they were finally out of Orion's reach. Orion grew to be a great hunter and used a large unbreakable club made of solid bronze to slay his prey. He was also assisted in the hunt by his two dogs, Sirius and Procyon. They hunted large animals such as Taurus the bull and small animals like Lepus the rabbit. After a time, Orion grew vain and boasted that he could hunt any creature on earth. In fact, he went so far as to claim that he would hunt down and kill every beast on earth. So when Gaia, the earth goddess, heard of this, she grew angry and sent a giant scorpion to attack and kill Orion. And that is how the great Orion died. In the end, Zeus gathered up both Orion and the scorpion and placed them among the stars. He took care to place the hunter and the scorpion far apart in the sky that's why Orion is only in the winter sky and we can only see scorpion in the summer sky. So that way they will never see each other again. Zeus also placed Orion's two faithful hunting dogs with him in the sky where they continue to follow him every day. In fact, the seven sisters, Taurus the bull and Lepus the rabbit are all in the stars keeping Orion company as he marches across the winter sky. So John, um, are you gonna show us something? How to- You bet. <laughs> so we're gonna step outside now. Now, actually, I forgot to mention we were started. Here in Riverside, we're kind of battling a bunch of clouds tonight. So some of our telescope operators that normally would be showing you pretty amazing views of the Orion Nebula, let's say, um, are battling clouds and some people actually battling rain. So we will show you the next best thing. We'll show you recorded images that we have, but at least we don't have to cancel. 
Anyway, so if we were able to go outside right now and look up, we would see in the southern sky, high above our heads, we would see the great, the constellation Orion. And now how'd this get there? Hold on a second, I'm sorry about that folks. So in the middle of the sky, high in the southern sky, if you were to go out, you'll definitely be able to see Orion. The large part of Orion, we have bright stars up at his shoulders, bright stars down by his ankles. And then in the middle, we have a series of three stars known as Orion's belt. And his belt, even if you know nothing about the nighttime sky, chances are people have heard about Orion's belt, even if maybe they didn't know what it was. But hanging down from Orion's belt, he has a sword. And in that sword is where we're going to go now. And Manny's going to show us the great Orion Nebula. Thank you, John. Okay, let's, uh, my name is Manny Lines. I am here in beautiful but unfortunately rainy Mariposa, California. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a quick look here uh, and show you my telescope, even though uh, you might not be able to uh, uh, look through it tonight. We'll, uh, we'll take a look. Uh, let me show you first. I also use a Stellarium. And uh, as John just pointed out, here's the Orion Nebula. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm going to uh, take a big chance here, and I'm going to tell my telescope uh, to move to the Orion Nebula. So here's where the telescope is pointed now, right at the North Star. And I hit the button, and the telescope begins slewing. And I'm going to show you, there is a live picture of my telescope moving to see the Orion Nebula. Now, you might notice that the roof of the observatory is closed. And that is, of course, because uh, we have that very rare occurrence uh, of rain, actually, here in California tonight. But uh, now you can see the telescope has arrived at, cool. uh, at, at uh, the Orion Nebula. So this is what I do when I control my telescope on a normal, on a normal evening. So with that, I'm going to switch on over. And I'm going to show you, uh, this is what you just saw, the camera on the front of the telescope here and uh, the, the mount. And I could tell folks more about this if you are interested. But let's talk about the great Orion Nebula. So if it were not cloudy tonight, this is the image I would have shown you with my telescope. So this is a 15 second exposure with the telescope that you saw on the, the previous slide. So here is the Great Orion Nebula. And this field of view is just about a little over two degrees. So if you remember, the, the moon is about a half a degree. So we could put four full moons right in here. The Orion Nebula is really quite large. Um, it is called, uh, to uh, folks that are amateur astronomers and others, it's called M. 42, that M stands for Messier. Charles Messier was the one that came up with a list of 106, I believe, night sky objects that uh, he uh, realized are not comets. He was a comet hunter, and so he put a list together of the things that are not comets. Uh, the Great Orion Nebula was number 42 on his list. It's one of the brightest nebulae in the night sky. You can see it in... Uh, 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 with your naked eye quite readily uh, from a dark site. Uh, it looks like a fuzzy star. Uh, it's really uh, much more obvious in binoculars or a small telescope. Uh, it's very, uh, very noticeable. Um, it's about 1,340 light years away and 24 light years across. So imagine if you're at one side of the, the, the uh, nebula and you you turn on your laser beam and you send it to your friend on the other side of the nebula. It would take uh, it would take 24 years for that laser beam to arrive uh, on his side. So it, this is a, also a star forming region. It's the uh, one of the closest star forming regions to Earth. Uh, 
if you could add all of the mass of all of the stars and the gas and everything here, it'd be about 2,000 suns in mass. So really uh, quite, quite a, uh, uh, a substantial area. This is one of the most studied and photographed uh, objects in the night sky. And uh, speaking of photographs, we're going to take a look here um, at, at, at the progression of imaging of the Great Orion Nebula. So uh, one of the first uh, sketches was made by Charles Messier himself back in uh, 1774. So you can kind of see the, the brighter areas here in his sketch. The first photograph was in 1880 by a man named Henry Draper. So this was using a, a, a camera that basically used a, uh, you had to paint an oxide on a, on a plate and then prevent that plate from getting into the light and then put it into the telescope and uncover the telescope. And so this is kind of the best they could do in, uh, in 1880. The first really detailed photograph was Andrew Ainsley Common, who was actually an amateur uh, uh, astronomer in just three years after a, uh, Draper, but look how much more detailed this is. And this was probably the first photograph that showed things that are not visible to the, to the naked eyes or, or even through a telescope because he was able to use a long exposure. Uh, he could collect photons that are not, uh, not, not visible, things that are too dim to see uh, even with a, with a decent sized telescope. Now, of course, uh, we, are, we live uh, in, in uh, amazing times where we have orbiting space telescopes. The Hubble Space Telescope took a picture of the uh, Orion Nebula back in 2006. And I have a blow up of this to show you. So here, uh, here it is, a uh, really, really dramatic uh, photograph. You could see all of the, the hydrogen gas and the nebula. I think you're gonna hear more about that. This is 520 individual frames. So 520 individual photographs in both the visible and in the infrared, which, which detects heat. And so uh, these little uh, things here that are kind of orange looking, these are brown dwarfs. So they are, they are failed stars that, uh, that basically uh, their nuclear furnaces uh, didn't quite turn on. Uh, so they're quite dim and, and cool as compared to stars. So pretty amazing sight. You can uh, see this image here and find out a little bit more about it. But in the center of this nebula is uh, what it, we call the trapezium, which is a, a number of individual stars. And I think Randy Watkins is going to tell us more about the trapezium. All right. Thank you, Manny. And just in case people out there are wondering, behind me is indeed an image of the Orion Nebula, my favorite. Okay, Sinan, you have some questions for us to ponder? Yes, of course. So um, everyone can see my questions right now? No, not yet. Uh, all right. So I am going to uh, share again. Uh, well, so this, the questions are actually related to what um, Manny was just telling us about. You can see the questions now? Yes. Great. So the first question is, what is a nebula? So think about it, how you would define it, and what would you describe what a nebula is? And if you feel that question is so easy, um, you could also try, try the second one, which is, is a nebula typically associated with the birth or the death of a star. So type it in the chat, um, let us know what you think, and uh, later Jessica will reveal the answer for us. Thank you, Sinan. Okay, so now Manny was talking to us about the great big Orion Nebula, how huge it was, and now Randy, and I can see that nice telescope there, Randy, is uh, gonna tell, tell us shrink down into the core of the Orion Nebula and what's going on there with an amazing group of stars. Take it away, Randy. All right. Um, yeah, this is a setup that I started out with here, uh, working this. It's, it's uh, unfortunately cloudy and I'm looking also through a palm tree, so I'm not using this as a live image, but I'm gonna start here with a 
uh, a little bit closer blow up uh, with kind of leaving off where Manny left off. Um, he had these beautiful color photographs of, you know, from Hubble and from his telescope. Uh, but what we're zooming in on is the trapezium or, or trapezium, however you want to say it, which is in the center here. A further zoom on, and this is what it would look like through that telescope, uh, a live view. You can kind of see some bleeding of the uh, starlight into pixels nearby. They're not really have halos like that, but these stars are incredibly bright. Uh, it turns out that uh, Galileo first discovered this back in 1617, and he didn't realize it, but he was the first human to witness stellar birth going on at the time. Uh, usually what catches your eye is these brighter stars in the middle. There's about five or six or something in that neighborhood that are fairly bright. Um, but there's actually over 2,000 in the central portion of the uh, 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 Orion Nebula. But um, as mentioned before, a lot of them are lower mass stars or rather dim and uh, a good number of brown dwarfs. Uh, but these ones that you see here are the complete opposite. These are very, very bright and massive and very young stars. Um, if you were to take a small telescope, something like about a six inch or, uh, or greater, you would notice that uh, these look like uh, two stars each. And actually, that's what you can see with a telescope when you uh, get into professional equipment turns out that this star here is actually four stars and this one's three. The big one, the biggest, brightest one here is called Theta Orionis and that's the big heavy hitter. All these stars are incredibly hot, but this one here is by means the most massive. This is one of the massive, most massive stars that astronomers have ever seen. This is something about 30 times the mass of our own sun. And it's about uh, something like uh, 251,000 times more luminous than our own sun. So if some wise guy decided to take our sun away uh, right now tonight while we have, uh, we can't see it, we will, and stuck Theta uh, Orionis in its place. So in the morning, we'd see Theta Orionis come over the horizon. We'd have something that's 20, 251,000 times more luminous coming over the horizon. I don't know about you, but does anybody have one million sunblock? Mm -hmm. The um, nebula here is lit up mostly by this guy. This guy does about 75% of all the lighting up of this cloud. The others fill in the other 25%. Um, this is kind of a small area. These bright stars are all within about one and a half light years of each other. So this is a fairly tight um, grouping. Uh, if you were on a planet, which there aren't any right now, because um, these things are too young, uh, you would have these massive bright stars all around you. And I'm probably pretty safe to say that you would never have a dark night to uh, try to get any sleep with those stars around. These stars are in the neighborhood of something like around 300,000 years old. But for stars, that's very young. Because they're uh, so massive, they're burning up their fuel incredibly fast. And uh, if you hang around uh, a while, you could see these things nova or su supernova. They'll go through their sequence and actually uh, go through a uh, cataclysmic end and blow themselves to pieces. You may have to wait a little while, somewhere around two to three million uh, years from now, but uh, trust me, it's worth the wait to see this happen. <laughs> um, <clears throat> The astronomers have also looked at, and uh, let me see, we'll go to this next one. And uh, with the Hubble have noticed, we don't probably not seen planets develop there, but they're seeing these evacuate, uh, these evaporating circumstellar disks around it. Some of this material is being blown away by this, the solar winds of the large stars nearby. This is where they believe uh, planets are forming around these stars. They're, they're too young to really have them yet. Let's see here, let me go back to this other one here. Here we are. Um, let's see here. They've also found something very interesting going on. Uh, they, they theorized, I think it came out about uh, 2012, that there is a um, 
a kind of intermediate sized black hole, which means it's not one or two solar masses, probably in the neighborhood of like 20 solar masses, but they haven't seen it yet. And the reason they think it's there is because they looked at the uh, direction and the speed of a lot of these stars in this whole nebula and realized that there's something massive inside this cloud that is driving these stars and changing their course. They even theorize there's a few stars like one in Auriga and one in Aries that may have originally come from the Orion Nebula, but were sort of kicked out by the gravitational tugging of this uh, uh, black hole, which means if there is a black hole in there, that is the closest one that we know of to Earth. Uh, let me go on to back to our constellation picture. And again, uh, as John showed, just look at the belt, go down to the sword and take a small telescope and look at the little fuzzy patch here. And you can see, you'll know it if you see it because you will recognize the shape. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Xenon. Well, thank you, Randy. And uh, now we have Jessica to actually reveal the answers uh, of the trivia question one. Jess, floor is yours. All right. So let's start with what is a nebula? So in short, a nebula is a giant cloud of gas and dust in space. Uh, they're composed primarily of hydrogen and helium, the two lightest elements, and also the two most abundant elements in the universe. They are um, often quite uh, brilliant, like the Carina Nebula that's shown here and the Orion Nebula that we just uh, saw. Now, if you look closely at this image of the Carina Nebula, you see these little yellow dots, and these are actually new stars that are forming. And this leads us into the next question. Is a nebula associated with the birth or death of a star? Well, both, actually. So stars begin their lives in a star-forming nebula. Uh, so this would be like the Carina Nebula with the little uh, yellow dots that were young stars. And all types of stars, whether they're sun-like or more massive, eventually follow along their life cycles and shed their gas, uh, whether peacefully in the case of a planetary nebula or much more violently in the case of a supernova, um, as they die. And these both produce, both these processes produce these very brilliant and beautiful but ephemeral nebula that last until the gas eventually finds its way back into interstellar space and becomes a star forming nebula once again. So yes, we find nebulas associated with both the birth and the death of stars. So with that, um, I will hand it back over to John. All right, thank you, Jess. All right, so we're gonna step outside again and pretend that we can look up in the sky. And there we see Orion. And we're gonna remember back to the story that we started with tonight, that Sinan and I told you the story of Orion. Oh, actually, hold on a second. We gotta zoom out here. Uh, hold on. Okay, so if we go outside and look up again in the high in the southern sky, you will see the constellation of Orion, right? And you can tell it's Orion because he's got that cool belt with all the diamonds in it all lined up. And if you remember from our story that we talked about, Orion went hunting with his dogs. Right? So we had a little dog, Canis Minor, also known as Procyon, and he had a much bigger dog called Canis Major, the big dog, also known as Sirius. And he went hunting, the three of them went hunting, and they hunted little things like the rabbit in Lepus. They hunted big things like Taurus. And when he wasn't hunting, Orion was trying to be romantic with the ladies up here with the seven sisters, otherwise known as the Pleiades, or if you're in Japan, it would be called Subaru. And uh, so this whole area of the sky you can see is actually all about the story of Orion. 
And uh, you don't see the scorpion here, right? Because he's way over on the other side of the sky and you only see him in the summer. And all these guys here by Orion, you can only see during the winter. Um, so hopefully once your sky clears up wherever you are, you go outside, look up, you can find Orion, find the rabbit, find the dogs, find the ladies. And uh, you'll always be able to next, whenever you look at that part of the sky now, you'll see it completely differently than in the past. So now after all this stuff we've been throwing out here at you, there's a chance for you guys to ask your questions and have us hopefully answer them. Do we have any good questions from the yes, chat room? Yes, we do. Uh, we have a, a question from Evan Fields um, asking, do nebulae contain heavier elements besides gases? If so, do those elements ever become part of the newly formed stars? And if that's so, where in the star are those heavier elements stored? The core? And I can take that, Zena, if you like. Great. Um, they're, they're actually, um, back when the universe first started 13, 14 billion years ago, the most, the, about the only element there was around was hydrogen and a very little bit of helium. And then remember how we said that all this stuff floating around got together and made stars and there were star forming regions? Well, at first, of course, that was only hydrogen to make so that, but as those stars uh, generated more elements, they blew them out as you saw in that graph earlier. And, and all of the elements, the heavier elements included, now form part of this cloud. Of course, it's still mostly hydrogen, but all the elements are there in a very minor degree. And then a second generation star forms. And now you're asking, you know, where do the heavier elements go in the second generation star? Well, one would think that they tend to sink towards the center because that's what gravity does. It brings the heavy things down towards the center. But you have to understand that also that these things are tremendously hot. They're boiling and, and things are just like a, if you boil water on a stove, you see the bubbles moving around, everything will get mixed up a little bit. So I don't think that in a star, you can store anything in one particular place. Sure, they would tend to go down, but there's to down towards the center, but there's so much energy that it's bubbling all through. But the key to answering this question is remembering that nearly everything in the universe, 99.99 something is hydrogen. It's the most common thing in the universe. There is other stuff and of course, after the second and third generations, there are heavier elements that are going off into the distance. And yes, they form other second, third, fourth generation stars. So later generation stars will have more metal in them, more metallicity. And I think that answers the question. Well, thank you, Alex. And now uh, it's time for our second trivia question. Um, you guys all did really well uh, on the first one. So the second, a uh, batch of questions actually is, uh, do you think stars appear to be all the same color in the sky? Think about that. Um, and again, if this is way too easy for you, um, if not, hypothetically, which are hotter, blue or red stars? So put your answer in the chat and uh, we will come back after uh, Brian's telling us about another magnificent nebula. Floor is yours, Brian. Go ahead, Brian. Okay, thank you very much. So we are going to the constellation Monoceros. And let me bring up your picture here so you have something wonderful to look at. This is the Rosette Nebula. So the Rosette Nebula is called an emission nebula. Now in the cycle that I believe Jessica showed us, we saw that some nebula or nebulae, the plural, were clouds of gas are where stars are born, and some is where the star has finished up its life. This is in the Born catalog. The rosette is about 130 light years in diameter. So if you think about that example again with the laser, if you shine the light laser from one side to a friend on the other, it's going to take 130 years for that light to reach your friend. When we look at the sky, the apparent size that it appears is 80 arc minutes. That's actually more than twice as large as what this moon appears to be. So this is a big nebula when we look up at it. 
In fact, it's so big, the four brightest portions of this nebula were recorded separately and given their own NGC numbers. NGC means new general catalog. But when we're usually referencing the nebula, we go by the number NGC 2237. Now, you'll notice in the center, you get a bonus with this cloud of gas. You get an open star cluster. These stars that formed in this cloud are lighting up the entire cloud, and they make up this open star cluster, which is seen in the center and sprinkled about in the cloud gas. We're going to talk more. There's actually a lot more uh, stars that we can see. This open cluster has a designation NGC 2244. Now, the young stars in this open cluster and the hydrogen gas of the nebula team up to give us this wonderful deep sky object. Well, the stars that we see, as I mentioned, aren't the whole story. Many more stars are hidden within this dense molecular cloud. In fact, a survey from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which lets us look at an entire different wavelength of light from what we can see with our eyes, showed us that there's about 2,500 young stars hidden from our view. At only a few million years old, these young stars put off a large amount of ultraviolet light. The light ionizes the hydrogen gas and causes it to emit light. So the Rosette Nebula is classified as an H2 region emission nebula. Now, Franco, I believe you have the answers to the questions that Sunan recently gave us. I do indeed. Let me go ahead and share my screen to go ahead and show everyone the answers to the question. One sec while I go ahead and change here. And there we go. So the first question that we went ahead and got started with was, do stars appear to be the same color? And from this image here that we can go ahead and take a look at, the answer is no. Some stars are bluer and some stars are redder than other stars. So here you already see that we have a good variety of stars, red, yellow, blue alongside here. And if you're wondering why stars, why certain stars have different colors than others, well, that's linked to its surface temperature. So here in this next slide, we can see to answer the second question that bluer stars are actually hotter than redder stars. And that has to do, like I said before, with the surface temperature of the star. If you guys are familiar with the light spectrum, you'll notice that visible light here in the middle, purple all the way to red, is typically where we see the color of the star. And wherever that light peaks or wherever uh, you see the light dominate in is this color that we actually see that star. So for cooler, redder stars, the light peaks more around the red side and even in the infrared, something that we actually can't see alongside ultraviolet as well. We can't see those two, but we can see the visible column and the red dominates there. For hotter stars like blue stars, the peaks are more towards the blue or purple and the UV side. So the blue will dominate since we can't see UV light and purple doesn't really uh, get caught by our eyes. So you mainly see the blue. And that's all I have to share. All right. Thank you, Franco. Now we're going to go outside again and this time look at Orion again. And here we're going to focus on one particular star. Again, we talk, Franco was talking about how the different colors and stars and how that's important. And one of Orion's shoulders, his left shoulder, is a star called Betelgeuse. And with a name like Betelgeuse, you got to love it. It's definitely my favorite star. And Jose is going to tell us all about it. Jose, take it away. All right. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Castro. I am the assistant director of Outreach for uh, Riverside Astronomical Society here in Riverside, California. And tonight, along with uh, the uh, University of California, the Astrophysics Department, I'm going to be uh, presenting uh, the star Betelgeuse. Um, the Betelgeuse is a dying star. Uh, it's, it's such uh, an old uh, star that uh, we were expecting it to go supernova on our lifetime, but I guess that is not going to happen. Now, why is it called Betelgeuse? Now, Betelgeuse uh, also, is also called Alpha 
Orion is. Second bright star in the constellation of Orion, marking the eastern shoulder of the hunter. Now, its name is derived from the Arabic word Bat al Jaswa, which means the giant's shoulder, because Bill Juice, it's uh, one of the most luminous stars in the night sky. Actually, it is a tenth. Uh, sometimes because of the it's dimming pattern. Now, as we said before, if you go out to the to your backyard facing the south, southeast, or southwest, you're gonna see the star Betelgeuse. It's very prominent on the constellation of Orion. You're gonna see the three stars over here. For my Latin speaking people, these are the three kings uh, stars. The dagger. All right. This is Rigel. And right here we have Beetlejuice, all right? Now, Beetlejuice, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, a really, really, uh, what do you call that? It's, it's a really, really uh, large star, okay? Uh, it's, it's estimated to be somewhere around 570 light years away from us, from our solar system. And uh, if, if, if we had gone uh, supernova, it means that we could have probably seen a couple of um, suns or at least visible for a couple of weeks, all right? Uh, it is reddish, very, very reddish, uh, as you can see on that image there. Um, it's, it's apparent magnitude is between uh, positive 0 0.0 and positive 1.6 and has the widest range displayed by any first magnitude star. Now, Betelgeuse is, is the nearest red supergiant star to Earth. Someday it will explode as a supernova, but when? Anyway, we don't know that. So um, just to give you a couple of facts, a few facts about it. Uh, it's a red supergiant. It's, its radius is 617.1 million kilometers. The distance to Earth is to be estimated at 642.5 light years, but actually it was uh, revised lately in a new study to around 570 light years away from us. Now, it was, it was estimated that the size of this star was so massive that if we would take our sun and put this star, it will take all the space up to Jupiter, but actually it was revised in that same study. And it's only apparently to be only two thirds of, of that orbit that it will take. Now, uh, if, if you look uh, the, up to the stars during the winter in the Northern hemisphere, you probably have seen, you probably have seen Bill Juice already. All right. So, um, this is another image by John Galbraith of what it looks like. The, you can see that the constellation of Orion is, is a field of stars. And right here, you will see the star Betelgeuse. Now, Betelgeuse, it's a really, really huge star. As you can see here, this image I'm presenting you is an image that I have taken from my observatory with my telescope. And you can see these other stars really, really, really small in the neighborhood. This is another star. I mean, another image of the star Betelgeuse taken from my observatory. And uh, I have a treat for you. I'm going to uh, look here. And I'm going to start sharing a live view of the star of Orion. Now, um, I don't know if you're seeing my... Yeah, we see it. Okay. So if you're seeing uh, over here, you actually get to see right here, you get to see the, the star. Right now, uh, it's a little bit dim because of the clouds, but you can see right there. Let me see if I can get you a little bit closer of a, of a view. So you can actually uh, see what the star looks like. You can actually see those beautiful... Uh, colors switching uh, because of the diffraction in our uh, atmosphere. But this is what it looks like. Let me do this over here. Uh, this is what it looks like um, through a telescope. It, this is a live view of what uh, 
the the star Beetlejuice look like. So with that, I am going to pass it on, and uh, I hope that you enjoy that. Thank you, Jose. All right, so we're going to step out and look at Orion again. But this time, when we're looking at Orion's belt, which you all, everybody should be pretty familiar with by now, we're looking at the far kind of lower left star. And right about underneath it there, we're going to see a completely different kind of nebula. And Amanda is going to take us there. Thanks, John. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Amanda. I am a graduate student at UC Riverside, currently located in the Chicagoland area where it's really cold and very snowy. Uh, but unfortunately, it's also raining in Sonoma. So I'm going to be showing you some pre-recorded images. But first, let me show you the observatory that I am able to remotely access. So this is called the Stonehenge Observatory. It is located in Sonoma, California, and it's a half meter telescope, um, Ritchie Christian telescope. So this dome is actually pretty small. It's only available to be accessed remotely. So there's not enough space for an actual person to be in there and be observing. Um, but it is pretty cool that we're able to observe uh, remotely with it. It has five different filters um, and you don't need to know very much about this other than the fact that each filter tells you something different about the object that you're looking at. So keep in mind today, I'm going to show you some images in the clear filter and in the H alpha filter. Um, so today I'm going to be showing you the Horsehead Nebula and you'll see why it's called the Horsehead Nebula in one second. Um, so this is the Horsehead Nebula taken through the clear filter. So remember what I said about how filters tell you different things about the object that you're looking at. Um, so the clear filter, all of these other stars are really, really bright, but there's nothing really seen in the middle. Now, when we move on to the H alpha filter, um, and you'll see it here. This is the Horsehead Nebula taken through the H alpha filter and H alpha lets in a lot of nebulosity. Um, and you can kind of see that nebulosity really shine through. And you can also see that the horse head looks kind of like a horse head if you kind of move your neck, rotate your neck 90 degrees. Um, so as John said, the Horsehead Nebula is located to the south of the easternmost star of Orion's belt, Alden Tack. Um, but you can't see it with your naked eye. You need a telescope to see it. It was originally discovered by William Mina Fleming in 1888. Uh, this one of the so-called human computers, uh, but it was first cataloged by Barnard in 1913 at Yerkes Observatory. And this Horsehead Nebula is actually 1500 light years away from us. So imagine, imagine that it took 1500 light years for the light from the Horsehead Nebula to reach us. Uh, and this is what it looks like when it reaches our camera. It is categorized as something called a dark nebula, and you can kind of see why the actual horsehead nebula is pretty dark. Um, and it's mainly, mainly composed of hydrogen gas and high levels of dust that block out the background light. But it's still illuminated, and it's illuminated because there is an emission nebula behind it that is emitting a lot of light, uh, uh, that is emitting a lot of light and sort of back illuminating it. The stars nearby also heat up and excite the gas around the horse head. Um, because it is a gaseous region, there's also some star formation happening in the horse head nebula, particularly of low mass stars. Um, the gas is, the, the cloud itself is dense with gas and dust and the dust inside is collapsing to form stars. And at the same time, it is being blasted by a very energetic star somewhere off to the right here, and you can't see it in this image because the field of view is pretty small. Um, and that star is actually slowly dissolving away the nebula. Um, the Horsehead Nebula itself is around three to four light years tall and two to three light years across. So as was mentioned previously, uh, if you shine a light from one end to the other, it would take two years to reach this way and three to four years to reach this way. Um, eventually it will disappear, but that will take a few million years. So we'll still be able to see it for millions of years to come. Um, but once it does disappear in its passing, a set of new stars 
uh, will be shining brightly and illuminating the sky and the cosmos. Um, so really quickly, let me show you what this would look like if we took a color image of this. Um, so here's the Sigma Orionis, by the way, this really energetic star that's blasting away at the Horsehead Nebula. Um, but you can kind of see how small it is in sort of this grander, larger field of view image and also what it would look like in color. Um, so that's it, that's all I have. Thanks, Amanda. Awesome. So I bet there's some questions we can answer from the chat box. There are a lot of great questions. Um, awesome. So first question from Nea asking, how are stars formed? Very good question. I can take that one. So stars are formed when enough hydrogen gas is able to collect together to start the whole process. So let's think about what Alex had talked about at the beginning. At the beginning of time, it was mostly hydrogen across the entire universe. The hydrogen is attracted to each other because of gravity. More and more hydrogen would collect together, which would cause that cloud to become more and more dense until it would become what's called a protostar, which is the beginnings of a star. Hydrogen continues to collapse and gravity starts to pull it inwards. As gravity pulls it in, pressure is created, which increases the heat. More hydrogen comes in. That process continues until there is enough density of the hydrogen and enough heat that fusion can occur. As soon as fusion happens, that means new elements are being created. For instance, our star is fusing hydrogen into helium right now. So that's what actually causes a star to be born, but we need something else to happen the star needs to have a balance because fusion, as you might, uh, might think, is quite explosive. So if the star doesn't balance itself right, it might explode everything back out again and it stops fusing. So we need a balance between gravity pulling the star inward and the energy pushing it out. When the star can balance between the gravity and the energy pushing out, it actually is in the stage that our star is in, which is called a main sequence star. And we like our star to stay right there because it's providing the right amount of light and heat for us to stay alive. Great, thank you very much, Brian. And uh, I believe the next question is sort of also related. So um, Rambo, uh, who's a six-year-old, uh, Rosa Jackson's son asked, how does a black hole form? Very good question. So we've talked about stars forming. What about the end of their life? That could be, and has been actually an entire topic for a different presentation on the different ways that stars can end their life. But if a star was massive enough, it can no longer overcome that outward pressure when it starts to run out of fuel. When a star is starting to run out of hydrogen and then it starts fusing helium and then it will begin fusing other elements, but then the energy output's different. So gravity starts to pull it in more and more. If the star was dense enough, that means all that material is coming into a smaller and smaller area, which means that is now a higher mass in a smaller location. When the star is starting to no longer fuse and collapses in deep enough and it had enough mass, then the gravity could be so strong that even a light photon cannot escape. And that's why we call it a black hole is because when we look towards it, all we're seeing is light that's not coming at us. It's just, we're seeing actually the effects of what the black hole is causing on energy that is around it or trying to enter into it. Thank you very much again, Brian. And uh, the next question is actually um, from another Brian, uh, Brian Brown asking how many generations of stars uh, living through their complete life cycles were required to create the requisite elements necessary for the development of life. Um, so I can take, yeah, that is a great question. And I can, um, you know, just try to give it a crack. So, well, that is a very good and frontier question. Uh, to be honest, the answer is we don't know uh, because so, well, there are, of course, generations of stars. Um, there are one category stars, which we call uh, pop three stars. And we uh, speculate those as the very first generations of stars. 
So when they first formed, they had uh, the most least metals or uh, heavy elements, right? So that was probably about like 0.1%. And when I say heavy elements, I basically mean all the elements that are not hydrogen and helium. Um, and for a star that is similar to our sun, uh, it has about, um, or even you know, younger than our sun, it would have about 2% um, of heavy elements. So, so far, um, we do not think that uh, the content or fraction of heavy elements that is a re restraining factor for the development of life. Because um, even for those very, very young stars, um, it still seems uh, rocky, small rocky planets are able to form around them, which means uh, there must have been enough elements or heavy elements uh, to form say like a rocky uh, planet, just like our earth, right? Because rock, that, that is uh, a lot of silicon and probably a little bit of iron inside. Um, so what we currently think that really limits uh, the possibility of life in terms of, uh, you know, type of stars is their lifetime. For example, uh, the life on Earth actually took about a billion years to develop. Uh, but some of the, the very massive giant stars, they cannot even live uh, beyond, say, like millions or hundreds of millions of years. So um, if we're expecting, you know, also human beings or similar type of life uh, to develop, then they simply just do not have enough time. Um, yeah, so I hope that uh, answers at least part of your question. Um, so, okay. Um, I guess uh, now should we do the raffle, John? Yes, it's time to give out some prizes. Or yeah, sorry. totally. So I will now uh, drop this ruffle link in the, in the chat um, and uh, the chat moderators feel free to uh, circulate that a little bit more. So put your name and contact information in there. Um, this time we will be giving out a total of uh, three NASA calendars. And um, well, our last batch was already out. So four people received them already. Um, so put your name and contact information in there. And if you win, we will reach out to you uh, to get your, your address. Excellent. So Great. should we wrap things up? Yes. Yeah, let's do it. You first. Okay. Um, so... Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I would actually uh, like to have a, a little bit plug uh, for UCR Astronomy. Um, and um, well, I, I don't know if um, all of you are aware of uh, that we are also having um, a Facebook page, uh, but I would like to show you um, and the chat moderators, feel free to directly drop it um, in, the, in the chat. Um, me share my screen. Um, so here you can see that this is our UCR Astronomy Facebook page. Um, if you want, um, you could like us, you could follow us, and we will post all the upcoming events, um, including both the virtual stargazing and Cosmic Thursdays, and of course, other outreach events that we're organizing all around here. Um, so, uh, as soon as we schedule an event, you will definitely be notified um, this way. So, if you're interested in following us along, um, yeah, give us a, a thumbs up or, or follow on uh, Facebook. Your turn, John. All right. Well, I'm going to put a plug in as well. As I mentioned when we were first getting started tonight, I'm the outreach director Oops, for the Riverside Astronomical Society. And if you are still with us at this point, my guess is, I'm not sure what just happened there, but the Riverside Astronomical Society is an astronomy club, mainly not for professional astronomers by any means, but by regular people that think astronomy is cool. So if you're in the Southern California area, anywhere near Riverside, you might want to look, a, look us up, join the club, participate in our activities. During this COVID time, there's less going on than during the regular time. So, John, um, uh, maybe you want to reshare your screen. Uh, we couldn't really see anything. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure. This is a... Uh... 
what I think I'm sharing isn't showing up. Um, but anyway, but if you do not live in the Riverside area, uh, chances are no matter where you live, there is an astronomy club near you. So Google it, find the nearest club and go check it out. Um, and there are, again, if you're with us at this point in the evening, you're probably pretty interested in astronomy. So, and I don't know why that just went away again. Because we're only seeing a, a black screen. Oh, here we go. Okay, see your list here. Okay, so things you might want to, pursue if you're interested in astronomy. Uh, tonight, when I've been showing you the night sky, I've been using a free download for your computer called Stellarium. It's a great planetarium software. And uh, if you want to go and uh, try out a great app for your phone or your tablet, check out Sky Safari. If you want to go to a website, download a free paper map and print it out. Uh, every month, because the sky changes from month to month, you go to skymaps.com and download the, the map for that month. Go on out and it'll show you what's up there. There's a couple of excellent magazines you might be interested in going to maybe Barnes and Noble, picking them up. Astronomy Magazine, Sky and Telescope. Uh, way to check, keep up on with the latest and greatest developments in astronomy. A terrific book for adults or you know, high school students, turn all about the hobby of astronomy as well as the science of astronomy is Night Watch by Terence Dickinson. And there's a chapter in that book, a lot of people wonder like, what if I want to buy a telescope? What kind of telescope should I buy, etc. And there's a whole chapter in Night Watch all about choosing a telescope. For the little kiddos, like elementary age kids who are interested in this kind of stuff, there's a great book called A Child's Introduction to the Night Sky. And that's by Michael Driscoll. And that's a terrific book for the younger, among, younger people amongst us. So check those things out if you want to keep learning more about astronomy, become more educated. Well, thanks, John. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess now it's probably uh, for us just to uh, you know, say a few words uh, before we see everybody again next time. Um, so, well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I hope you really enjoyed your time here. As mentioned earlier, we would really appreciate your feedback on um, our show, um, our event. Um, and you would also get a chance to sign up uh, for our email list in the survey that we will be sending you this Friday, so tomorrow. Um, uh, the survey will be completely anonymous, so we will not see uh, you know, any identifiable information, but simply just appreciate the comments that you leave for us. Uh, we haven't scheduled our next event, uh, but it should be somewhere in mid slash late March. And uh, yeah, we will definitely let you know and also post it on uh, Facebook and Twitter, all kinds of um, social media channels and also email advertisement um, once we have that scheduled. So thank you again, everyone, and uh, we hope you have a good night. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Hope you learned something fun. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.